Mary and Leela, thank you for gracing us with that beauty to begin our service this morning. And beloved community, grace and peace to you from the God who is our light and our salvation, the one who circled this place on the map for you this morning. Whether you are part of First Church, a joyful and justice-seeking church in the heart of our nation's capital, or whether you are a guest or friend joining us from many different locations, we welcome you to worship this morning. In this sacred hour, may your heart be encouraged, and may you feel the belonging of home. Here in God's house, may you find rest for your soul. Last Sunday marked the day when we transitioned from the leadership that held us fast for all of 2023 into a new slate of leaders who have already picked up the torch. And so it is truly a gift to receive this morning's call to worship from our incoming moderator, Lindsay Swisher, whose competent and compassionate leadership will serve us well. Following worship, please join us in the narthex for coffee and fellowship. Friends, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome into the shared experience of worshiping the God whose love knows no bounds. So let us cross the threshold into sacred time, beginning with our opening hymn, God of Grace and Glory. That's number 436. Please rise in body or in spirit.
Good morning. So I was born and raised in the UCC, uh, also a First Congregational Church, but First Congregational Church of Battle Creek, Michigan. The Swishers were an active church family, and my three siblings and I participated in a lot of church activities. Church is where I, as a kid, as a kid, first learned how to speak to and interact with older people. It's where I learned public speaking skills. It's where I learned about social justice and the importance of giving back to the community. When I was in high school, the UCC had just rolled out its Our Whole Lives or OWL Comprehensive Sexuality Education Curriculum, which I know we're using here. And as an active peer educator at my local Planned Parenthood, I was thrilled when the church decided to pilot it with my senior high group. I'm sure much more excited than the adult facilitators who had to lead my senior high group. I turned 18 in a church basement on a service trip to Washington, D.C., awoken by my mom who had chaperoned and some friends singing happy birthday to me with a small cheesecake from the nearby grocery store. My favorite. I didn't realize what an integral and formative part of my life, church, and my church community had become really until I left for college. When suddenly thrust into a new environment, five hours from home with none of my high school friends nearby, I felt a bit adrift. I found a UCC church and I attended very sporadically, something I would continue over the years as I moved around. I just couldn't quite get myself up on Sunday mornings, I will admit. It wasn't until I landed in DC and finished graduate school that I really felt the desire to find a church community that felt like home again. I searched the UCC website to find a place in DC that matched my own values and I settled on First Church almost immediately. And this was in the midst of COVID and virtual worship services. So you guys were doing something right, that's for sure. <clears throat> it's been a wonderful thing to be welcomed so wholeheartedly into this community. First, during COVID, with weekly young adult gatherings facilitated by Reverend Sam to build and maintain connection. And then on my first commission, Care of Parish, really getting to contribute to what makes this community so special. While it can be a daunting task to take on a position like moderator, I really feel a deep spiritual calling to help foster a community that provides and nurtures in the same way others did for me growing up. I feel called to create a place where everyone is welcome, including those like myself, who are still asking questions and trying to understand our own religious and spiritual beliefs. At every step of the journey, whether I felt rooted and secure where I was or totally adrift not knowing what was coming next for me, which there are plenty of those moments I've had, I knew that I could walk into a UCC church and find some comfort and some grace. So I know this year will be one of continued growth for this community and I am really grateful to help play a role in that. Our covenant as First Church reminds us that we walk together in ways revealed to us, ways we may not even have in our imagination yet. So I would ask you to be open together to what we do not know and the role that this church can play, not just in our community, but in our own personal and spiritual growth in the year ahead. Good morning, boys and girls. I would love to invite the children and youth to join me on the chancel here. Uh, that would be one plus Simon and Brendan and Jonah and Laura and Eleanor and some brave folks from the back, maybe Greta and Barrett and Wallace. And we're going to wait a little bit. As people wait, you know, it's always really special when it's their first time at church, right? So we are really, really excited that it is Echo Zawada's first time at church. And baby Echo is up there, and I don't know if she can see us, but she can definitely hear us. There Echo is. So we are so thrilled that Mike and Echo and Aaron are with us. So that is something, as we talk about uh, church growth, that all makes our hearts much bigger. Um, so hi, Echo. And Echo, someone else wants to say hi to, and that is our dear friend, Bear. Welcome, Echo. Okay. Um, good morning, boys and girls. Everyone's, oh, people are still coming. Wonderful. It's great to see everybody. Um, can we say Happy New Year to Bear? Happy New Year, Bear. Happy New Year, boys and girls. High five. All right, all right, all right. So, boys and girls, we have a very difficult topic today to talk about. And that topic is, what does this say? It is trouble. Trouble. Is that like what we talk about every 
We talk a lot about trouble. Now, the, the, sometimes we talk about trouble. There, I'm going to take over here. All right, sometimes we talk about trouble in mistakes we make. We have regrets. And sometimes we end up in timeout or the doghouse. Now, raise your hand. Really have a doghouse. Well, well, it could either be timeout or dog. Raise your hand if you've been in timeout or the doghouse. Everyone's, everyone's, everyone's hands are raised because we have all been in the timeout dog. That's right. More than time. There you go. There you go. Well, we all make mistakes, all of us, and that's part of being human. And um, and God forgives us. And um, this is not the type of trouble we're going to talk about right now. We're going to talk about a different type of trouble. We're going to talk about holy trouble or good trouble. And this is a type of trouble that God calls us into sometimes when it is inconvenient, sometimes when it puts ourselves at risk. And we get into holy trouble usually because we see something in our society, in our community, that is wrong. And there might be people in society that are allowing thing, these things to occur and we've got to have the courage to go into that and say, you know, we got to correct this wrong. And in Sunday school, we're going to talk about a story where Jesus goes into a temple because things are wrong in the temple. And he has big feelings and he shows those big feelings and says, this is unacceptable. And that's what happens. And sometimes we need to have big feelings and show and get into good, holy trouble. Now, I'm going to show you a picture, and everyone else can see the picture here, too. So if you, I'm going to send, Ellen, if you could take a picture of that and send that around, and then you're going to take this photo here, uh, Felix, and you're going to send that around. And this is, a, what do you see a picture of? What do you see a picture of? What's that person doing? A guy praying. A guy praying. That is a gentleman praying, and that is not any gentleman. That is one of our saints here at First Church. That is the Reverend Bruce Hansen. Now, so Reverend Bruce Hansen, had my role here at First Church in the early 60s. And he was called to good, holy trouble. So he asked for a, a break from church so he could go down into Mississippi on the buses with the Freedom Riders and go teach, um, go into the communities of Mississippi and help teach people about the importance of voting. And he was a leader in the civil rights movement. And his legacy breathes in this community and lives out with us. And he was, went into good, holy trouble, as so many of those civil rights heroes did. And because of that good, holy trouble and the legacy they have, and he's called, why do you think he's praying? Why do you think he's praying, Simon? Because he wants to feel God's courage and God's wisdom and God's strength with him. Yeah, Eleanor. He could be praying for other people. And he could be praying for the people that need help in, in the South. Exactly. Exactly. So these next few weeks, we are going to explore how we are called to be beacons for justice, agents for change, you know, whether it's in our school, our community, near or far, we are called to be in holy trouble. Okay. And um, today, we're going to learn from uh, Bayard Rustin. And unfortunately, Reverend Jason Carson Wilson is not with us today because he's under the weather. But he runs the Bayard Rustin Initiative. So we're, later on, he's going to share us what, everything he knows about Bayard. He was a famous civil rights leader who was involved with the March on Washington. So friends, let us say a prayer. And before we say the prayer, I'm going to invite all the children and youth to stay after passing the peace so we can hear Simon um, lead us in the call and response. Um, all right. Loving God, grant us wisdom. Grant us courage to be in holy trouble, knowing that you are always with us. Amen. And now I invite us all to rise and share the peace of Christ with one another.
That's peace. Peace first church. See everybody. Good to see you, Ann. Good to see you, Liz. Hi, Freda. Hi, Helen. Hi, Grace. Hi, Paul. That's Peace Olsen's. That's the Garrity's. Everybody and Jessica. Lisa. Oh. Hi, Freda. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Ann. Peace. Me. <laughs> with you.
join me in a responsive reading. Praise the beloved, O my soul. I will give thanks with my whole heart. Wondrous is creation, great builder. Full of honor and integrity are your teachings. You lift the hearts of those who suffer. Your steadfast love is food for the soul. You are ever mindful of your covenant. Your, your word is truth to those with ears to hear. You bring new life to the world. Yes, life and abundance is your glorious gift. Revenance for you, O oh holy, is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, scripture reading is from Mark 1, 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not just as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue one with an unclean spirit who cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Nazareth, Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked the spirit, saying, Be silent and come out. And the unclean spirit, convulsing the person and crying out with a loud voice, came out. They were all amazed, and they kept, asking, they kept on asking one another, What is this? a new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey. At once, Jesus' fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh God. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week I was asked by Linnea Morris, member in discernment, how do you understand ministerial authority? Where does authority come from, and how do you lose it? These questions reveal the tension between the vocation of professional clergy and our commitment to the priesthood of all believers, this idea that all human beings have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. Good churchy questions, I know, but stick with me because how we answer these questions has a direct impact on our life together. I shared with Linnea that more and more I see authority in terms of two things, trust and accountability. Authority is not something automatically conferred. It is a relationship of trust tended over time. Clergy have a particular calling, no better or worse than others. We give our lives over to leading worship, pastoral care, baptizing, blessing communion, marrying and burying. And over time, like any vocation, we gain experience that can transfigure into wisdom. To give oneself 
over to the church is no small thing. And so the ordination vows we take matter. At the end of the day, we stand before God and are accountable to God's people. In the congregational system of the United Church of Christ, I am part of a three-way covenant with this congregation and the Potomac Association of the United Church of Christ, a fellowship of neighboring churches. But make no mistake, one can be in a leadership position, even in the church, without wielding true authority. To the extent that a faith leader earns trust and opens themselves to accountability, I believe their authority will flow accordingly. In today's text, Jesus went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he taught in the synagogue. It's the image conveyed on the front of your worship folder. And Mark's gospel notes, they were astounded at his teaching, for he taught as one having authority. A bit of shade is thrown here on the scribes as the murmuring crowd distinguished between his authority and what they were accustomed to in the pulpit. We've never heard anything like this before, they said. You get the sense that it wasn't just the content of his preaching, but the tenor of it. The authentic embodiment of it. I imagine his preaching sounded like a clear toll of the bell in the gut, looked like the pure light pouring through a vessel, a mediation of the holy through every word and breath and pause. Just then, his preaching was disturbed by one with an unclean spirit crying out, and who knows what demon might have been stalking him? Anger? Envy? Addiction? We can feel a bit squeamish talking about demons. But what is the animating force today behind idolatry? Conspiracy theories? Mob violence? Whatever it was, this demon recognized Jesus, and Jesus silenced the spirit, exercising it. The crowd was amazed, or as some scholars translate it, panicked. Who was this with such authority that he commanded even unclean spirits and they obeyed? Our friend and esteemed theologian, Rita Nakashima Brock notes that the image of Jesus as an exorcist is someone who has experienced his own demons through temptations in the wilderness. One who, through his own experience, understands vulnerability. She writes, naming the demons means knowing the demons. To have faced our demons is never to forget their power to hurt and never to forget the power to heal that lies in touching brokenheartedness. Jesus hears below the demon's pleas an anguished cry for deliverance. And Jesus delivers. Jesus saves. The Latin root of salvation is salvus, which translates as health. The good news, Luther Smith has said, is that evil cannot pitch its tent outside of God's campground. There is no relationship, no situation, no hardship beyond God's saving power. There is no condition, no circumstance bereft of creative possibility. There is no diagnosis, no disaster, no day beyond the authority of God's delivering hand. 
The Reverend Dr. James Forbes puts it like this, God is the quantum energy of love dispersed throughout all creation, the multiverse, and within each one. And God is nudging every particle in the universe toward participation in God's dream. While God's dream may sound aspirational, like something everybody can get behind, Mark's crackling account reveals a stark truth. God's kingdom, to which Jesus devoted his entire ministry, was incompatible with the social order represented by the religious and political authorities. Oh, there were many magicians and miracle workers who traveled from town to town in Jesus' time to heal the sick and despised. They did charge a fee. But Jesus' exorcisms and healings asserted a different authority. According to religious law, anyone deemed unclean could not enter God's house of worship. They had to undergo cleansing rituals, then appear before the priest who would announce them ritually clean and restore them to community life. Jesus' miraculous healings subverted this social order as he moved between the temple pulpit and those cast out from religious life. Women with the issue of blood, Demoniacs, lepers, paralytics, all were prevented from entering the temple until they were first healed. Jesus' healing power drew them back into a community that was satisfied to keep them out. The most radical thing about Jesus' healing is not that it transgressed natural law, but it's transgression of social order. And let's be honest, that social order still holds sway in human communities and in our own hearts. There are parts of ourselves that we believe somewhere deep down are not welcome through the doors of the sanctuary until they are healed, our shadow sides and wounds. Don't show up if you're in a hard season, depressed, going through a divorce, in the throes of addiction, let go from work. We hoard these secret griefs. And if we're not judging ourselves, we're thinking it about someone else. Barbara Brown Taylor says that we all have a secret list of people we'd rather not sit next to. They may be specific people you can name, or they may be certain kinds of people. Some are on the list because we're snobs, she continues, but others are there because we believe they are sinners. That might not be the word you would use, but it captures the feeling well enough that there are some people who offend us because we believe they have offended God. The problem, Taylor insists, is not that we are loved any less. The problem is that people we cannot stand are loved just as much as we are by a God with an upsetting sense of community. Jesus offended many in his day. And let's be honest, his ideas still offend so many now that his name has been hijacked in service of concentrating power, fomenting outrage, and excluding others. Jesus was offensive because with one word, one look, one touch of the hand, he cut 
through every stratification calcified by the authorities of his day. His was the face of love, and he gazed upon eyes haunted with pain and grief and loneliness, and he refused to yield to Sabbath laws or social mores. He had to heal, to exercise demons, to restore. I think of Sister Helen Prejean, advocate for so many on death row. These were not innocent men. They had committed horrific crimes. They spent years denying what they had done, their whole lives playing games to fool even themselves until the time came to meet God. And Sister Helen, in her persistent, authoritative way, cajoled them toward reconciliation with their victims' families and with themselves. And when the time came for them to die, she proclaimed their human dignity to stand before God forgiven. As they walked toward death, she would accompany them. Up to the very last moment, she would say, look at me. I will be the face of love for you in that chamber of death. And that's what Jesus did on that day in the synagogue. He became the face of God gazing upon one tormented by a demon, working the miracle of restoration, flipping the script of the religious and social order, calling everyone who saw it to greater love. His was an unmistakable authority. The quantum energy of love poured into one being, brimming with light, nudging every part of us toward God's dream. That great breaking groan of floodgates opening so that every suffering soul began to seek him out. Every afflicted part of ourselves, limping, crawling, grasping our way toward that widening circle of his light, his gaze, until nothing in the universe is outside of it. The face of love gazing upon us even now. Beloved community, may every part of you be restored. Amen.
As we invite you this morning to give of your tithes and offerings to build up the ministries of this church, I just want to take a moment to celebrate and lift up our anti-racism ministry here at First Church. We have an anti-racism committee uh, that typically meets once a month, and we, we met on Wednesday. And together, we identified uh, several books and movies that we will be exploring and inviting you to explore uh, during the Lenten season. This will be, uh, gosh, I'm not sure if it's the third year or the fourth year, but we will be having Lenten learning circles. And those circles, Lent begins on uh, February 14th is Ash Wednesday, which kicks off the season of Lent. Lent is 40 days of preparing our hearts to receive the mystery of Easter, the mystery of resurrection. And so during those 40 days, we invite you, if you would like, to sign up for a Lenten learning circle. These circles will be meeting uh, virtually on Zoom, and each circle will explore either a book together or possibly a film. There is one workbook included. The link to fill out that form can be found either in your Friday newsletter or in the digital worship folder, which is on our website. This is really an opportunity not just to be part of any old book group, but to learn together in community, to deepen relationships, relationships of trust and accountability. And so I would invite you uh, to consider that, that invitation and to know that when you give to First Church, you are supporting ministries that build us up to be out in the city, out in the country, out in this whole region, supporting policies of equity, supporting greater racial justice, and equipping ourselves for strength for that journey. We know it's a lifelong journey. So uh, the easiest ways to give, if you are in the sanctuary, are on your way out to give. There is an offering plate um, there at the door, along with a QR code. If you're joining us on Zoom, um, there is a link that Barry will provide that will take you to our donate page. And you can give there via Vanco or PayPal. We always welcome checks in the mail. However you give, we are so grateful. We know that all of our gifts come from the gifts that God has blessed us with, and we pray that as we return them to God, God will make of them greater peace and justice in the world. I invite you now to rise and join me in the doxology. As we move into our time of prayer, we begin today with prayers of the people. Um, we will bring around the microphone to you, and if there is a joy or a concern that you would like to lift up for this community, I would encourage you to do so. I wonder, LaTanya, would you be willing to take this microphone around? LaTanya is another one of our members in discernment who's seeking ordination in the United Church of Christ. I would like, uh, on? is it on? Yeah. I would like to ask prayers for the family of John's brother, Tao, who died this morning at four o'clock after a long battle with heart and cancer. And I ask prayers especially for his wife and his six children and John's sister, Lucy, who is now 
Without mother, father, and brother, she remains the only one of her original family. Thank you so much, Barbara. And if you are a newcomer among us, you might not know that Barbara's late husband, the Reverend John Mack, served as a senior minister for many years here at First Church. And he is beloved, and we will pray for his family. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I was not expecting this to be quite so apropos to your sermon, Reverend Sam. But um, as I celebrate my uh, uh, one year and one day of sobriety, I wanted... <laughs> Um, I just wanted to uh, offer uh, and, and ask for prayers for everybody who is still trapped and stuck in active addiction and um, to their families who are either have already lost um, their loved ones or who have already felt like they've lost them through addiction and um, just lift everyone up with that. Thank you so much for sharing, Aaron. We truly celebrate with you. I ask for uh, traveling mercies. Um, I'm going to, um, heading to El Salvador uh, tomorrow with a group of faith colleagues. Um, and we're gonna be meeting with a diverse community of activists from around the country, um, folks working on um, labor rights, environmental justice, um, uh, reproductive justice and rights for women, LGBTQ. Um, and it's a really challenging time for El Salvador and actually a lot of countries in Central and South America as they really face um, um, a, a strong threat of authoritarianism. Um, uh, so um, uh, ask for your prayers and um, ask uh, for prayers for the people of El Salvador. Thank you, Sandy. We look forward to hearing about that when you return. We'll pray for you. Thanks. Um, prayers for my partner's family. His grandmother is receiving hospice care right now. Um, and she um, moved here in the 30s as a Jewish woman from Germany at the onslaught of, um, you know, really the start of persecution of Jews and um, has, has led a wonderful life, is 95. Um, but no doubt it will be a challenging time for them anyway. Um, and I'm realizing I don't know her first name because they just call her Umi, which is the name for grandmother. So prayers for, uh, for Umi. Prayers for Umi. Thank you, Lindsay. I am very joyful that I have been found fit of physical and mental capabilities so that I am now going to be a resident of Goodwin House Alexandria. So I'm going to be concentrating on that for the next six to eight weeks. Holly, we celebrate with you. What a wonderful place to be. Um, I ask for prayers for Deborah McDowell. Uh, many of you in the church uh, know her. We usually um, sit together. Um, Deborah was uh, rushed into the hospital on Thursday, and uh, she's still there. Um, They've, uh, they found a tumor on her thyroid. Uh, Reverend Amanda, thank you very much. So uh, please pray for her. The results are coming in the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Prayers for Deborah. I would just offer words of prayer for the people of Gaza, for the continuing circumstances there. There's been news in the past couple of days of different um, sets of potential ceasefire negotiations, peace negotiations. It's, it's a very complicated set of relationships. Um, uh, and I would just lift up a prayer of hope that the people involved in those neg negotiations might be able to find a path to something new. Thank you. Well, the other big story in Baltimore is my goddaughter had a boy, and I'm now a god-grandfather. And everyone's in a good place. Thank you, Jamie. Um, prayers for the victim and for the family of the victim of the police shooting in Noma this week. 
Um, for those of you that didn't hear about that, there was a um, man who was experiencing a mental, a crisis of mental illness, and uh, he was shot by police and killed. So prayers for his family and for the community. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Casey Elizabeth. Um, somebody else with demons that we know, Brandon Dean. I mean, I, I, uh, who was has a very complicated relationship to this church, and he wrote some of us an email Friday. I'm not advocating, you know. I just hope, you know, he has he has demons. Uh, I I wish him peace, so that he can um, function. For himself and his dog yeah so thank you for lifting that lucille we can pray for brandon and we do thank you i don't know latanya might have a magic touch because we had a lot to say today <laughs> Uh, I just want to remind us to lift up continued prayers of comfort um, for two families in our midst. Um, one is the Goodfellow Mills family who is here this morning following the loss of Christie's father, which I announced last week. I also announced last week um, that Whit Wheeler, who was scheduled to join last week with his wife Kristen, uh, his father died last Sunday morning, and continued prayers of comfort for them following the funeral service for his father, which was earlier this week. Let us pray. For this hour, oh God, we shut off the noise and come to you bewildered by a world that still chases after power and might. We come because we yearn for your love. We come because the frailty of the human heart confounds us. We come because we struggle to make sense of our lives. In our secret yearning, we long for your healing. And in our despair, we often doubt that you can fix what ails us. Gaze upon your people in this season of possibility which runs so quickly to fatigue. And in this time of yearning which becomes so easily quarrelsome. Give us the grace to cry out for your healing from weary throats. Nudge us toward participation in your dream with a hope that defies all cynicism. Come in your power and come in your weakness. Make all things new, O oh God. As together we pray a version of the prayer Jesus taught the disciples together, praying, O oh cosmic birther, from whom the breath of life comes, who fills all realms of sound, light, and vibration. Focus your light within us. Make it useful. Create your reign of unity now. Your one desire then acts with ours. As in all light, so in all forms. Grant what we need each day in bread and insight. Loose the cords of mistakes binding us as we release the strands we hold of others' guilt. Let us not be lost in superficial things. Free us from what holds us back. From you is born the all-working will, the strength to act the song that beautifies all, from age to age it renews. Truly, power to these statements. May they be the ground from which all my actions grow. <coughs> Amen. Friends, I invite you now to join us for the closing hymn. I'm pressing on the upward way. Please rise, embody your in spirit.
Before our final blessing, I want to remind you to check our newsletter website and social media pages for announcements. If you are a new guest worshiping with us who has not yet connected to our email list and the life of our church, and you want to stay connected, please complete a visitor's card. Matthew is holding those cards up at the back there. And if you're joining us on Zoom, a link to the digital visitors form can be found in your worship folder. And now just a few announcements. Uh, following worship, join us in the narthex for coffee hour and fellowship. Next Sunday, you are invited to our first community potluck of the new year. The theme is tailgate. All are welcome, so please do bring a dish to share. We want to spend time with you. I also want to urge you once more, just reminder, sign up for one of those Lenten learning circles. That link can be found in the digital worship folder or in our Friday newsletters. I want to thank all who made today's service possible. Uh, Tom Sowers on sound, Barry Mills, our Zoom moderator, Mary Hayes, our exquisite violinist who will bless us again momentarily, Lindsay Swisher and Simon Hendler Voss, our liturgist, David Greer, our scripture reader, our usher, Matthew Lagama, Nyla Dixon, our Sunday morning coordinator, the First Church Choir under the direction of Leela Coyle and our Coffee Hour hosts, Robert Mann Thompson, Anthony Leonard, Nora Marsh, and Peter Gerlach Mack. And now for our final blessing. Beloved community, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face of love shine upon you and give you peace. Go now to live justly, love abundantly, and walk humbly in the ways of Jesus. Amen.